Welcome back to the channel. It's Tavares from Gally Dating 101. And I just want to apologize for those of you who tuned in last week and didn't get an episode. <laughs> but you were here today. That shows that you're a part of the Godly Gang. You are subscribed and you're, you know, keeping up with us. If you aren't subscribed, I encourage you to do so. There are plenty of episodes that will encourage you. And there is going to be some, you know, family videos and all the type of things we'll be doing in the future. But I appreciate you guys for tuning into the podcast week after week um, and supporting the channel in general. Um, we do know we have a countercultural message, um, but we are striving to live for God in our purity, in our relationships, in our lifestyle. That's the goal. If you messed up before you listen to this episode, I pray that something in here encourages you to keep striving for God's will. Um, but yeah, so if you haven't, be sure to check out the Godly Dating 101 book. Um, I'm always going to plug that in every episode because I'm hoping that you guys get that and you leave your reviews. But today, I want to talk about ways that individuals manage to get themselves manipulated. And I know the title is going to say, you know, singles, but I think some of this happens in relationships as well. Um, so don't don't think that this is only for one demographic. But let's just jump right into that. Here are a few ways that people get manipulated because I shared a post um, and I thought, well, I'll just make a post that talks about a video that talks about more ways that people get manipulated. One of the things, first of all, God said you're my spouse. Now, I don't know where this line came from. Please comment below if you're on YouTube and someone has told you before that God said you're my spouse. Um, you know, because I have to, we have to accept the fact that everyone is not hearing from God. Um, a lot of people like to say, oh, God said this. God said that. God showed me this. And, you know, folks will tell you, you know, God showed me that the sky is purple. And then the thing is, if you're not that spiritual, man, you're, you're probably believe them, you know? And it's like, who really wants to argue with some, I trust them. I believe that they're spiritual. So when they tell me something, you know, that God showed them, it's easy for me to fall prey to it, you know, but chances are their emotions lie to them. Um, Jamaicans have this, um, I think it's a saying, I don't, I don't know how you will put, so, you know, some myth, I don't know how the right word for it, but they're like, if you eat a mango before bed, you'll have a bad dream. Now, I don't know if Americans have heard that before, <laughs> maybe it's only a Jamaican thing, but they say, if you eat a mango before bed, you have a crazy dream. And I genuinely believe people are, whatever, eating something crazy before they go to bed and then they have some odd dream and they feel as though it was a revelation from God. Um, now, is God able to tell you who your spouse is? 100%. I'm not saying God want to tell you who your spouse is. I'm not saying it's impossible for him to do so. I'm just saying... A lot of times, God ain't telling people nothing. It's a matter of our emotions told us something, and we ran with it. You know, it's so easy for us to assume this is God's will because that's what we want, you know, and that's, it's very common. Sadly, even in a church, it's, it's very rare that people are using discernment, meaning that you're testing the spirit, you know, you're you're seeing if it comes from God. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you're having on headphones, I probably just scared you, um, but we see that I believe it's in First Timothy, but it says, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits, you know, because there are many false prophets that are out there that believe they have a word from God. And unfortunately, they do not, you know, when they manage to fool a lot of people. And don't get me wrong, some people do have genuine motives. They're just wrong. So if someone tells you, God said, you're my spouse. Okay, well, I'll, I'll wait until he confirms that with me before I, you know, hop on this bandwagon and manage to get myself inside of a marriage that God isn't a part of. Because I want you guys to see something. God is not going to reveal something about your future to everyone else except you. And, you know, because it wouldn't make sense that God, you know, I believe that God is a very personal, uh, a God who desires relationship. So if he wants you to be aware of something, don't get me wrong, he can always tell your pastor first. He can always tell your parents first. He can always reveal something to other people first. And as always, other people can see something in us before we see it in ourselves. But I don't think God is going to tell other people who I'm supposed to marry before he tells me. There was a guy in my church um, growing up, and I remember him saying, you know, God showed me um, you're going to marry, you know, a certain person. <laughs> and the and it's not a matter of how the person looks. I'm not saying this sound insulting, but I was just like, there's no way that the God that I served <laughs> you know, is telling you that I'm marrying that person. There's no way God would have showed you that. you know. And now for me to not have married that person, um, bro, where did you get your information? 
And plenty of people have said, oh, brother so-and-so, man, he's always trying to prophesy over someone's life. I guess they desire to be a prophet so bad, so they're always prophesying something when they're always normally wrong. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not getting into that because I don't want to be petty. But this is what Jesus says in John 10, verses 27 through 28. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. So Jesus is making it clear that if we claim, bear in mind, if you're a person who's, you're not even a part of church, you just stumbled on this episode and you're trying to figure out what I'm talking about, this may not relate to you. But God tells us that if we are calling ourselves followers of his, then we have to be able to hear his voice. And sadly in church today, many people don't know the voice of God. We only know the voice of our pastor, which is somewhat okay if pastor's hearing from God, but there are a lot of pastors that aren't hearing from God. There are a lot of motivational speakers. There are a lot of people who they're just inspirational. And even if they are hearing from God, that does not mean God only desires to speak with them. You know, and unfortunately we get so accustomed to waiting on the man of God, the woman of God, or some spiritual person to speak knowledge into us, speak wisdom over our lives that we don't get to hear the voice of God for ourselves. And if I don't know God's voice, then Jesus said, I believe it's the King James Version where it says, you know, they're not going to follow a stranger, you know, but so it's very easy for us to, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a person who they're not, they maybe not be trying to manipulate you, but they're not leading you closer to God's will because they're not speaking on behalf of God. They're speaking, you know, there's a lot of people with pulpits and, you know, titles and all kinds of things, but it does not mean God is the one that's guiding them, you know? So we have to be willing to, to, to spend time. This is not something that happens overnight. You have to be willing to spend time in order to learn God's voice. And the number one thing about God's voice is that it's not going to contradict God's word. So if somebody's telling me, oh, God said this, but God said, you're my spouse, but that person doesn't even go to church. How did God speak to you? If you don't even spend, you don't even go to church. So you don't read your Bible, but God was speaking to you to tell you that I'm your spouse. You know, it's just like, how does how does two and two make 18? You know, that, that doesn't even add up. You know, so we have to be careful that we're not allowing, you know, ourselves to be manipulated by anyone. And, you know, so at the end of the day, I understand that someone can say something they felt like God said and, you know, unfortunately have been wrong, but you have to be able to hear God's voice. And as you develop God's, um, a relationship with God, he will guide you. Um, James 1 and 5, it tells us that if you lack wisdom, ask God and he'll give it to you freely. So if I don't know who to date, I can ask God. If I don't know if this relationship is from him, if I don't know the words that this person said to me is true, the Bible says if you lack wisdom on a manner, you ask God about it. Many of us, we ask social media, we ask our friends, we ask everyone else before we ask God. But God is saying, if you lack wisdom, ask me and I'll guide you. Um, you know, so God wants to reveal his plans to us. James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. So the closer we get to God is the closer he's stepping towards us. So if somebody says, God said, you're my spouse, but you're not taking steps closer towards God, you won't know if they're right or they're wrong. So God forbid they are right. And you heard Tamara say, nah, that's manipulation. So I'm not going to believe it. But if you were spending time with God, maybe he was trying to show you this all along. You know what I mean? So it's not a matter of just taking nuggets that you you get from this podcast or from your pastor or from everybody. It's, it's from developing your own walk with God first and foremost. Um, the second thing to know how people get manipulated is the, the game of if you love me, then you would. And I believe this definitely happens a lot in relationships. You know, the person who likes to guilt trip you into getting what they want. If you love me, you would have sent naked pictures. You know, you know, you could trust me. I'm not going to send them around. You know, I'm not going to do anything with it. Or well, if you love me, we could have sex. So if you love me, then we would, why, why would it be an issue for us to do this? You know, and I feel as though a lot of those things are, are normally from selfish motives. They're never um, said in a way that helps the other person is always in order to help what I want. And they make it seem like you don't have a genuine love for them unless unless all of their needs are met. And what does that mean? Manipulation. You know, it's a form of controlling. And, you know, this is not just something that I believe happened to women either. Plenty of men, oh, why, why are you overthinking it? Let's just do this. God will forgive us. And it's like, it's a form of manipulation because 
if they're causing you to go outside of God's will, then they can't be sent from God. We see with Samson and Delilah, she's manipulating him because she's asking him for his weakness. And Samson is like, I'm not going to tell you. Like, what, what, what do you want to know that for? So Samson lies to her. And he gives her, you know, some false story a couple times. You know, he give her this lie, a lie three times. Do this, then I'll lose my strength. Do this, and I'll lose my strength. Do this, and I'll lose my strength. And she hits him with the line that, how can you even say you love me if you're you're deceiving me? You're you're making a fool out of me. You're making me look bad. You're claiming this is the truth. And unfortunately, Samson gets tired of hearing her complain that now he gives her his secret. So the moment Samson... So Samson allowed himself to get weary by her constant nagging. He allowed himself to get frustrated by her constant complaining. Oh, if you love me, then you would have told me. Oh, if you love me, then you wouldn't lie to me. Oh, if you love me, then... And it's like, Samson managed to lose out on his strength. Now, many of us who read that story, and because we know the end, his hair grew back and God used him one more time before you know before his his death. You know, so we look at it in hindsight, 2020, oh, wow, God got the glory. But a lot of us, we don't look at it in the middle of what's actually happening because that's where a lot of us find ourselves. You're not willing to compromise with the person you're dating or the person you're interested in initially. That's the thing. That's how the enemy works. So if he tries to get you to stumble, fall into sin, sexual sin, temptation, um, go go party, go turn it up, go do go to some places you don't have no business being at. Hey, let's go to this strip club. Hey, let's go to this party. And you know, none of those places, the Bible says light has no fellowship with darkness. I know that's not common, especially if you're newer to church. Um, you may not like this type of teaching, but it's the truth anyhow. Um, a lot of times we we neglect what God is trying to do because we're entertaining someone that he didn't even send. So now you, you get so frustrated by their constant, hey man, let's just go to the party one time, like... Bro, you turn on a party every single weekend. Let's just do it that one time. Man, this man claim he love us, man. You claim you one of us. You you claim you claim you like this girl. You claim you like this guy. And it's like, eventually, now you're looking like, okay, just this one time. But then you realize you get manipulated into doing something that God never intended for you to do. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Um, one person once said, if you want to know if a person loves you, insert their name where love is, and see if they're lining up with these things. And, man, that's very hard to do. <laughs> but the Bible says love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. And that's um, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 in the New Living Translation. But the part that I want to point to in regards to this topic we're touching on today is the fact that it says it does not demand its own way. So when you're saying, oh, so I'm doing this out of love. No, no, no. You slept with them hoping they would love you back. But that, that doesn't, sex doesn't keep a man and sex doesn't keep a woman. So love doesn't seek its own way. Anytime someone is willing um, to manipulate you to get what they want from you, that person doesn't love you. Anytime a person is to say, oh, if you love me, then then you do this. But why is it a problem if you claim you love me? Now they're worried about their, their needs and their emotions and their feelings more than yours. And unfortunately, if you're not even in a marriage and a person is talking like this, then that means not only have they placed their needs above yours, but they've placed... Um, their urges above what God desires for you because they're saying, I don't love you enough to respect your commitment to God. Now let that sink in because you thought, oh, you know, it's our hormones. You know, we just, just got a little carried away, but they weren't respecting your boundaries. So if, if they won't respect your boundaries, then that means they don't respect your God. How can they claim they love you? Not, let's, let's get you out of the picture. How can they claim they love God if they won't respect your boundaries? How can they claim, if he's a man, how can he claim to be the future leader of the marriage if he won't respect you, won't respect the boundaries, he won't respect your walk with God? And if she's a woman and she's pushing that line, if she's not respecting her own walk with God, why is that a woman you're going to assume is a Proverbs 31 type of woman that you should be pursuing? 
And that's what we as believers have to be careful of. Because the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. It's not controlling others. You know, and there's a part where Jesus tells us, and I saw a lot of people who think, you know, you're just saved, you know, and they try to, oh, it's, it's, by, it's by faith, it's, you know, sinner's prayer. And it's like, yeah, the scriptures show us that by, by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, less, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Ephesians 2 and 8. However, um, I heard a person put it this way. They said, God has a love language and his love, his love language is obedience. <laughs> Because Jesus says, if you love me, you would keep my commandments. So now, tomorrow, you just set up a person is saying, if you love me, you do this. That's manipulation. We have to understand that the Bible makes it clear God is not a man. You know, God does not operate how we as humans operate. When I say something, I may have my own personal agenda behind it. When God says, do this, he's not doing this for a selfish agenda. He's doing this for our protection. And that's what we have to learn to understand. It's very, it's, it's hard to obey God when we think God is, you know, uh, that's going to be my next point. You know, it's, it's hard to obey God when you think he's withholding from you. But it's easier to obey God when you realize, oh, he said this to protect me. It's easier to submit um, when you understand, oh, that person is doing this out of love, out of protection. They're doing this because they know if I go do what I want to do, I might hurt myself. And that's why God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But the Bible also tells us his commandments are not grievous, meaning they're not burdensome. They're not overwhelming. They're not hard. It's not hard to live for God. It's hard when you live for God, but you want to hold on to the world. That's when it becomes hard. Because Jesus tells us something. Uh, I should have pulled that verse up, but he says, you know, take his yoke upon us, you know, because it's light. It's not a heavy burden. Um, you know, it's not like God is requiring us to do something that's going to harm us or overwhelm us. No, but trusting him, even in the middle of chaos, brings peace. But because it was kind of overlap, overlapping, um, I might have to just jump into that next point. Um, people normally get manipulated because the enemy wants us to think that God is withholding fun from us. You know, because a lot of times we think compromising is going to bring some form of acceptance you know, but sin never guarantees commitment from a man. You know, sin doesn't guarantee commitment from that woman. You know, you can give them all the sex that you believe is necessary for them to be happy. That does not mean they're going to marry you. That does not mean they're good, that that's going to sustain the relationship. That's why it's important for you to find validation in God before a relationship. Because before Jesus' ministry started, you hear the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So he didn't have to do anything. To have validation. And we need to understand that in a relationship, you don't, when God is the one sending them, you don't have to, oh, do this or else I, I don't believe you love me. That's that's a form of manipulation. But like I was saying with point three, the enemy, I believe he wants us to think that God is withholding fun. Um, we see that in Genesis. Genesis 3 verses 1 through 6. I don't want this episode to be long, so I'm not going to read all those verses. But we see that the enemy played a trick on Eve's mind. He knows they shouldn't eat from the tree, you know, so he confronts her and then he says to her, you know, did God really say you can't eat from the tr from any tree in the garden? And the woman is like, yeah, I mean, we can eat from all the trees, but, you know, the tree in the middle of the garden, you know, we shouldn't eat it. We shouldn't touch it. And boom, right there, he already knew he got her because God never told her you can't touch a tree. That tree may have served a different purpose. Maybe it was good for shade. Who knows? But God never said, don't touch a tree. He said, don't eat it. So maybe her brain is thinking, I'm not going to eat from a tree if I never touch it. So she misinterpreted what God said, maybe to protect herself. However, he's like, what? You're not going to die. What are you talking about? God knows that when you when you eat from this tree, you're going to be like him. You're going to, yeah, he's going to open like a God. You know, and now the woman is looking at the tree and she's starting to see like, oh man, this tree is actually, this tree is actually really good. This is, you know, like. Her senses get heightened. All of a sudden, the very thing that God said to avoid, now she's partaking in. And now she heads to her husband who's there with her. So now we see God gave them complete freedom to do what they wanted to do in that garden. But the one thing they decided to do was the one thing they shouldn't have. So I believe that's how the enemy works. 
because there's a lot of times people people will message me or I've heard people ask others. So like, what do we do for fun? Like, man, church is always hindering us from having fun. Like, man, the leadership is always hating. Like, dude, anytime we didn't even do nothing. Nobody was who nobody was even drunk. Like, man, I just went to a party and it was a problem. You see, because that's how the enemy works. When you are striving to please God, when your your flesh is being crucified, you know, through prayer, through fasting, um, through studying the word, through consistency in your relationship with God, when your flesh is dying, holiness doesn't seem like a problem. It seems like a privilege. But the problem is when your flesh is in control and you're allowing your emotions to guide you, now you believe that God is hindering your fun. Now you believe that God is stopping you from being happy. Now you believe that holiness, instead of being a privilege and instead of it being you know, a blessing from God, now you're viewing it as a prison. Now you're viewing um, the ability to obey God, the opportunity to obey God, the blessings in obeying God. Now you're viewing it as, oh my gosh, the church with all of their rules and their obligations. Man, I got to get out of this church. They're, they're, oh, there's so much legalism. Now, don't get me wrong. There's legalism in, in plenty of churches. But the problem is when we start viewing separation from the from the world as though the, the, the world is what we should be after and God is withholding the fun from us. Man, why can't I dress like everybody else? Why, why, why do I have to be the one weirdo at my school? That's the type of questions you hear. But it's like you don't understand that you can never impact the world that you're imitating. We can never make a difference in a world that we're copying. How do you make a difference when you are the exact same as every other person who's out there? And then I, I remember, you know, my first duty station while I was in the military. Because for the most part, you know, I was always in church. But when I first got to the military, there was no no churches around just yet. You know, because I was brand new. Not even a couple weeks. But I knew one of the guys from, you know, my, my basic training, you know. So it was pretty good that I had a friend there. And I remember, man, I'm just like, I ain't been to church in months, you know. Because the training is like, what churches are around? <laughs> you know what I mean? Military churches are, are not always the best, the ones that are on base, that is. Um, but I remember, man, I'm just like, cool. You know, I've been in church in a while. I'm just kicking it with the boys, trying to fit in, trying to do whatever. And then, you know, so they probably weren't even aware of my my, my, my beliefs, my, 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 my Christian stance at the time. I mean, you probably saw a Bible in my room or some Christian books, but that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Anybody can have a Bible, let's be clear. But I remember... One time, the guy, because of something he was going through, he was, you know, ready to take his own life, for lack of better words. And I remember he came to my room crying. And all I could do there is, is realize that I'm over here trying to fit in with this dude who's lost, who's about to take his own life. And we know some unsaved dude about to take his own life. There is no hope for him when he hits that grave. You know, and it's like, if you don't believe in hell, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Because if, if heaven is real, hell is as well. But I remember him coming to me, you know, and I had to encourage him and pray with him. And it, it just hit me. It's just like, I'm really trying to fit in with people who don't know that there is hope outside of what they're going through. That in the middle of your storm, the Bible tells us that God is a present help in a time of trouble. And that happened on deployment as well. You know, just chilling with the boys. And I remember somebody asked to borrow my laptop. And godly dating um, existed at this time, but I remember he asked to borrow my laptop. And then, I don't know what he was doing, but he came back and he was just like, man, I love that that message that you that you preach. And I was just like, what are you talking about? But I had godly dating posts on my laptop screen. And then he was just like, nah, bro, I saw on your homepage this powerful message that you had um, in regards to relationships God's way. And I was just like... That was the same dude I was trying to fit in with. You know, I was like, I wanted to be cool like him. You know, that's that's what I'm thinking in my head. But it goes to show me that there are so many people that they look so cool and they look like they're having fun. And the enemy wants us to think we're missing out. We got to be like them, not realizing God placed you around them to be the only light that they see. Their life is full of darkness. Their life is full of chaos. I don't care what city you're in, what state you're in, what country you're in, because I know this podcast reaches other countries as well. But you think because you're the only person in your school, you can't be modest. 
You think because you're the only person in your school that's holding on to their virginity, or is now because you're a Christian and you're you're holding on trying to be celibate and saving it until marriage now. You think because you're the only one doing these things, nah, it's not worth it. It's time to compromise. That's what the enemy tries to get you to do. He tries to make you feel as though, man, there's no point. There's no need. Everyone else is doing whatever they want until now you realize, oh, God placed me here to be the difference, to start, to be a trailblazer and to bring holiness into this school environment, to bring righteousness into this school environment. You know, and I got a whole bunch of people in my class now. You guys know I'm finishing up my nursing, my nursing degree. I have a bunch of people in my class now. And then, you know, it's like you're not too pushy with your face, you know, because they all know where I stand. You know, we talk about it, you know, they have my social media, stuff like that. But then then it's like somebody would jokingly be like, ask Pastor T, you know what I mean? And it's like as much as I hate being called Pastor T, (laughs) you know, it makes me realize, no, even when they don't want to come to church with you, even when they might reject your your request for a Bible study or anything like that. They know where you stand spiritually. And the same people who will laugh at you because of your Christian beliefs are the same people who are going to run to you when they know, bro, I don't know what to do. I feel hopeless. I need help. And it's like, you will think, that person, you really need the help. You have all the money in the world. You're passing all your classes. You have a really nice job. You're married. Because a lot of single people think, because you're married, you have it all figured out. Oh, you have the kids because, you know, you may be struggling with infertility and you feel like that person has everything you want. And it's like we look at everyone else and feel as though, man, God, you're stopping me from having what I want. But the Bible tells us in Psalms that no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. So we have to understand that God is not aiming to withhold pleasure from you. God isn't stopping you from having fun. He's stopping us from allowing temporary fun to be our God. Because that's the downfall of of many of the young people in the church. One of the biggest reasons why Godly Dating was started and the reason why I still continue this to this day. um, Because if you guys pay attention to our page, I'm not a great influencer. I don't know how to do all the cute reels. I don't know how to do all the pointless posts. I don't know how to, oh, let's let's just post it. And people post all kinds of things. And it's just like, I understand. It's social media. But I'm just saying, I don't care for the fame or the hype. You know, so... It's like, I, it's like, why do I do that? Why do I? So why do you keep the page if you're not trying to do all that other stuff? And it's like, bro, because majority of everybody I grew up with, I'm talking about people who was doing way more than I did. I mean, I was in church every day, choir, media team, prayer team, um, whatever it was that was needed, preaching, teaching. I was doing whatever, singing on the choir, you know, praise team at one point. So whatever it was that was needed, I was part of it. And all the people that I was serving with, and bear in mind, this church is hundreds of people. Nine out of ten, if I were to go on, go down the list and grab ten, like ten groups of ten of them, nine out of ten of those I don't think are in church anymore. And I'm telling you, it was not because of the teaching that we were receiving. A lot of people just was like, this just isn't it for me. And most times, it was because of the person that they dated. Someone let them out of, out of the church. And that's the reason why I got like dating. You know, I'm passionate about it because I'm like, if we can stop a generation from leaving God because of, they were in some relationship they never should have been in, then, you know, it's a win. And, you know, I know plenty of people that follow me that listen to no advice that I give. <laughs> you know, plenty of, you know, a bunch of babies, no wedding. Uh, plenty of, a, you know, a bunch of women that they're, you know, talking to every single week and no commitment. You know, so I understand People aren't going to listen, but my goal is to stop the cycle that we're seeing in church. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Now, when you get into a relationship, a lot of people think that it just becomes easy because you both love God. But what I'm learning is that it's absolutely necessary that both of you work on yourselves individually in order to get to that place whole. Because it's not two halves. It's both of you stepping into a relationship whole. And that way, you're not bringing trauma or necessary baggage onto your spouse or the person you're currently in a relationship with. Now, if you're a person who's struggling with past issues, trauma, baggage, whatever it is, abuse that you may have gone through, I think therapy is a great place to start, um, especially if you don't know someone close to you You know that you can speak to about these things. And if you're thinking about trying therapy, I would recommend BetterHelp because it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, 
and it allows you to do things on your own schedule. It allows you to fill out a brief questionnaire and that way they pair you to the right therapist. And if you are not connected with that person well enough, you can always switch. Become your own soulmate. Work on your own self, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Godly to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Godly. A fourth way that people get manipulated is number four, our social media diet. Because let's be realistic. You didn't think that you were behind until you saw what everyone else was doing. You didn't feel as though you were lonely until Valentine's Day is coming up. Now everybody's posting their little boo thing. You know what I'm saying? Everybody got, they got the flowers, the bouquet, um, you know, the rose bouquet. And, you know, now they have a, a bouquet of money now, some weird new trend. But you didn't think you were missing out until you were looking at everybody on the feed. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't believe that you need to, you know, just flat out unsubscribe and unfollow all the people who are happy in the relationships. Um, Because that would be kind of petty. But I think it's super important sometimes that we take breaks from social media, that we we mute people, we unfollow people if we have to. We just take breaks because social media is the way they create these apps is to keep you on all day. They don't want you to get off. They want you to stay on all day. They want you to to look at reels all day. They want you to be on TikTok till two in the morning, wake up. Here's a brand new TikTok. Look at it again. The way social media is operating is for, you know, algorithm is created to keep you on, you know, that's the goal of social media to keep you there. But unfortunately, if it's causing you to lose, lose your mental health, your peace, there's no reason why you should be on it. If it's causing you to be so distracted that now you can't pray, now you can't read the word of God, there's no reason for us to be on it. And that's me included, not just you, not just singles. But this is what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 10, 12. Oh, don't worry. We want to dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are, but they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as a standard of measurement. How ignorant. Now, bear in mind, Paul is telling us it's foolish of us to start comparing ourselves to one another, because if we look at it this way, if Tavares looks at, um, if Tavares is looking at God, I'm realizing I have a far way to go. Now, if Tavares is looking at somebody with a small podcast, I'm looking like, boy, I've arrived. You ain't making money like me. You ain't got followers like me. Your page not popping like mine. I can walk in pride. Now, if I can look at somebody big time, um, Tim Tim Ross, he's he's a big time podcaster. I, I'm not recommending his content to anyone um, because I haven't enjoyed the content, so I can't tell somebody to go listen to it. But if I look at his his podcast, I'll be like, man. He got so many guests. He's popping. He's blowing up. He's going viral. It's easy for me to look at his uh, content and say, Lord, Lord, why don't I have that? Why? You know, this is what I need. And then eventually I'll get manipulated um, thinking that I have to do what um, Tim or whoever it is, any podcaster, he's just a a popping guy right now that I I know I could name. Um, I have to do what he's doing in order to grow I have to do what he's doing. They're a young married couple. Uh, you know, some people that are like, that's a podcast I'd recommend, especially if you're married. But if I see them going viral, oh, nah, I have to do what they're doing. And now I allow the comparison game to manipulate me into not doing what God called me to do. Now, many of us, we want to be like X, Y, Z. Oh, man, they have so much more followers than I do. So I need to do what they're doing. And you allow the comparison game to lead you out of your own race. You want to be like that church down the road. So now you start comparing yourself. You see, I'm telling you, social media will destroy you because there's so many people. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying social media is all, all bad. There's plenty of influencers that I get encouraged by every time I see them doing something I'm not doing. And I'm like, oh, I can do better. Oh, I can give more. Oh, I can, you know, where you see the relationship goes. And it's just like, this dude, he just built his wife a shed. And then the reel is only a minute long. So now you're just like, am I supposed to do that in a in a day? Like, you know, whatever. But it encourages you to say, oh, there's so much more I can do for my family, my wife, my kids. So there's benefits to social media. But the, the huge downfall of it is, as believers, we should be aiming to point people to Jesus at the end of the day. But so many of us, we allow our platforms to point back to us. And which is fine. You know, it's your page. Post yourself as much as you want, but I want to be clear. We have to, as believers, remember, 
our goal is for God to get glory. So it's easy for you to follow somebody and you get jealous, or you get envious, or you even get prideful. But all those things, you, oh, well, my point is, all those things are not going to happen if you're taking breaks off of this. Put the phone down. These phones are destroying us, you know, so be willing to avoid certain things that you don't get caught up in. You know, I have to date this type of person because social media, everybody's dating this type of person. I have to be married by this age because social media, everybody's married by this age. I need a baby by this age because on social media, stop it. Get off of social media because it's going to cause you to make decisions God never told you to make. It's going to cause you to walk through doors God never told you to walk through. So we have to be careful we don't play in that that um, social media trap. And this one leads right into what I was saying before. Um, so I won't say too much on it. But another thing that manipulates people, um, I want to save this closer towards the end because I do know it'll be controversial, <laughs> you know, um, but I've said it before and I'm, you know, 10 toes down. I'm, I'm saying it again. We get manipulated a lot of times by these influencers who prey on vul people's vulnerabilities. Um, they have conferences, how to do this, how to do that. But in the conferences, it's not that beneficial. You get a little nuggets, you get a little charged up, and the conference is over. Okay, pay for this. And it's just like, hey man, <laughs> I'm all in I'm all in favor of Christians earning money. I do not believe we serve a broke God. I don't believe that um yeah, obviously, we shouldn't be having a prosperity gospel. But like they said, we shouldn't have a poverty gospel either. I don't believe that you should be serving God. And to prove you're serving God means you're poor. I don't believe that that's God's will. Um, I believe the only reason why God wanted that rich young ruler to give up his money is so that that man's money want to be an idol in his life. But I don't think God have a, has a problem with people having money. In Acts, there were people, the Bible says they, they all brought what they had, so they had all things common. Uh, so in other words, rich people brought all their money, broke people brought their two coins. And yet the two coins didn't matter because the rich man brought his and now we all got money. You ain't got to worry about that. So it's God's will for the church to be united. It's God's will for the church to have funds. It's God's will for his people to be blessed. But it's not God's will for his people to love money. Can you love what money can do for you? Yes. Can you love what money can do for your family, for the church? For your future, yes, save your money, be wise, do not spend being, you know, being foolish, you know, or living a frivolous lifestyle, trying to impress people on the internet, but we cannot think that it's okay for us to use the pulpit to build our pocket, because if nobody's being saved by my message, but I'm getting rich, I'm telling you, that's a surefire way to to displease God. If you're preaching only because of what people are going to pay you, that's a surefire way to upset God. If I'm only doing this podcast because, oh boy, I might get some money on this podcast, then nah, man, you, you missed the whole point of what God was trying to do. God was trying to change lives through this podcast, but you were just trying to get some money. God was trying to change lives through your ministry. You were just trying to get some money. One of the things I love about Christian merch and I'll probably put out some more in the future. But one of the things I love about the merch is not, not the fact that you can get paid from it. Because I've loved this since I was a teenager. But I love the fact that it's a conversation starter. Many of us, we don't know how to share the gospel very easily. You know, we might get a little timid. We might get a little, little shy. But imagine you have a shirt that just says, Jesus loves you. You may upset a lot of people. But yes, you might also encourage one person that was going through something that they needed hope. So it's not a problem when you do these things to get money, but I've just learned that I've met too many, one too many influencers who who they use the church to, to get paid. Whereas you read their book and it's not helpful, but or you read, you watch their channel, whatever, anything they're doing, you know, it's just, oh, let me get some money in my pocket. You know, and it's just like, I feel as though God is God is exposing that. In this day and age, you're realizing a lot of people are money hungry and God, God is going to reveal that to you. So just be just be wise of that, that you don't get led astray by somebody who's trying to use you for money. Uh, and the last thing I mentioned, we get manipulated by our own emotions. Yes, it, would, it was no need for an influencer. 
There was no need for the devil. There was no need for any person you were dating or whatever. It was our own emotions that manipulated us to do something we shouldn't have done. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. See, the devil knows it's easy for us to allow emotions to guide us. It's very easy for, well, my hormones want that, so I really don't care what God is saying right now. I just want some cheeks. I really don't care what God is saying right now. He just looks so good, so I'm going to go do what I want. Like, it's so easy for us to think, oh, the devil got to do this. Nah, a lot of times it's, it's our urges, our own hormones, yeah, it's our emotions that led us outside of God's will. So it's easy to want, want what we want and just expect it immediately. And that's why waiting on God is frustrating. Because when your mind is made up, you don't pray and seek God for clarity. You don't pray and ask God for direction. You don't consult your pastor or your spiritual friends. You just do what you want. We allow our emotions to be the guide. Instead of, instead of allowing ourselves to be driven by emotions and feelings, we have to be willing to seek his will. Because our heart will lie to us. Jeremiah 17 and 9 says the human heart is desperately wicked. So above all things, the Bible makes it clear that it's desperately wicked and it's deceitful. So many of us, we think, follow your heart, man. Just follow your heart. Don't follow your heart. Follow Jesus. Your emotions are very valid. Um, but use your brain, you know. Make sure that God is the one guiding you and it's not just, oh, how I feel. Because how you feel in the moment can land you in prison. How you feel in the moment can land you with a baby. <laughs> How you feel in the moment can end a relationship that wasn't supposed to end. You know, so it's important that we're not allowing all those things to happen based off how we feel. So we have to constantly ask God to purge our hearts, purge our motives. And that's single or married. You know, emotions have led many of us to the wrong relationship. Emotions led many of us back to a relationship that God tried to save you from. So I'm telling you, it's important that we don't allow ourselves to be driven by emotions. Follow Jesus, not your heart. I know that sounds odd, but it makes sense. <laughs> Seek the Lord and he will guide you. But I appreciate you guys tuning on for another episode. Godly Dating 101, 101book.com. That's how you'll get the get your copy or your 100 copies for your church. Love you guys and be seeing you again next week. Peace.